name is Nate uh, Westerfield. I'm the Creative Arts Pastor here. Um, I'll be here. I'll be here 13 years in February. So um, been here with Pastor Chris and Pastor Dan and Pastor Bill for over a decade. So it's been fun getting to know them over the decade, but also all the new guys as well and girls. So uh, getting to know them. So um, it's a pleasure. And um, today, um, as as uh, I get the opportunity to speak in the last Sunday of the year, isn't that great? I mean, it's like a privilege. It's an honor. You get to end the year, so it better be good, right? So, <laughs> uh, but um, hopefully it is. But we'll we'll see. Um, you can let me know later on. So, but um, today I really wanted to talk about criticism, particularly what I like to call acidic criticism. So it's it's very different than constructive criticism. Constructive criticism is something I think we all like to have in our lives, uh, for the most part. I mean, sometimes it may be a little hard to hear, but honestly, it produces a positive result in the end, right? The whole purpose of constructive criticism is to help us get better. And um, we, we may be a boss, and we get to offer constructive criticism to our employees. We get to offer it to our children as parents. Um, and we also get to receive it as an employee, um, maybe as a mentor. Sometimes we get to receive it from our spouses. Sometimes we may not like that, but we do get to receive it, right? And hopefully it makes us better. But um, it's constructive. It's not there to tear us down. It's not there to hurt us. It's there to make us better, to help our relationships be better. But acidic criticism is vile and destructive. It does nothing but eat away at the individual or persons involved. It is toxic. And so acidic criticism corrupts. It corrupts indefinitely sometimes. But I had to think about this. I, as I was praying and thinking about what to speak on, I've known for a while that this, this weekend I'd be teaching uh, to end out the year. I figured, I was thinking, how do I deal with criticism? Do I struggle with the cynic criticism? And I, and, I, and I think we all do in some capacity. We all have those buttons that get pushed that we just can't do anything but criticize, right? And, but, but what happens is sometimes it becomes more than just criticism. It just becomes something that eats at us. And we don't find any enjoyment in that uh, outside of our lives, and so we have to criticize it. And it makes us feel better for a moment when we criticize it, but again, it just continues to eat away at our heart and our mind and our soul. Some thing you can ask my wife is, um, and I inherited this trait from my mother. Um, my mom, my mother's a little OCD, so um, on things um, like my mom and dad have a dishwasher, but they don't use the dishwasher because they don't get the plates clean clean enough for my mother. Right Now, we do have a dishwasher, but I am very particular about how the things go in the dishwasher. Now, Pastor Jake had a message a while back about where the spoons and the knives go and which direction. Um, it does matter to me, right? It does matter to me. You can ask Kaylee, my wife. Um, it does matter. The cups go in a certain way. The pans go in a certain way. When you put them back, they go a certain way. Um, and so, but, but in one way, it's good, right, because there's order and there's cleanliness, but in the same way, it can go too far, right? It can go too far to where when I'm putting dishes away or I'm putting them back up in the cabinet, man, if she only would have done this right. <laughs> man, if it would have been put the way this way, it would have gotten cleaned. There wouldn't be a cup full of water in the dishwasher if it was put the right side down, right? 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 We, we go through these things. We struggle. We wrestle things. That's a small thing, but these small things eventually become big things, if we don't deal with them appropriately. They become acidic in our lives. I think with my boys as well, you know, they're in sports, and to some degree, basketball, and uh, we do baseball. My boys really want to play football, but I'm just kind of that dad that's just holding them back a little bit. So you can do it in high school. Um, both my brothers did it, and my brother actually played Division III um, college ball at Taylor University, and man, he loved it, but man, did he get beat up. And his whole body struggled the rest of his life with just back and like so I'm like, you know what? I'll let you play high school. I wanna I wanna hold you back, but they wanna do it even the more, right? But a lot of times when it comes to baseball or basketball, I see them do things that I know how to fix, right? I know how to make them do the things right, and I struggle with saying, No, you're not doing it right. Well, or they'll do it and I'll show them three or four times and then and then they won't do it 
the right way. And so I'm like, come on, you got to do it the right way. But we even have to be careful as parents because these things can build up and build up. And before too long, we realize that we're just heaping this acidic criticism on our kids. And I've been guilty of that, my own, my own boys, of saying too much, going too far, and it hurting them and, and, and eventually could wound them and maybe even remove them from the sport altogether because of how my attitude was, right? We have to be careful as parents that we. Same goes for employees and friends and family. We have to be careful of the words that we choose because oftentimes when we criticize ourselves, which I think this is what a lot of this comes out of, we're so hard on ourselves that we impose that on other people. We begin to take our own criticism and what we're not happy about, what we're not good enough at, what we could be better at, and we start to impose it on other people. And it starts to become acidic because they can't live up to our standards. And what right is it for them to do that, right? We, we don't need to impose that on them. We can work together as a team to, to be better and to encourage each other to, to do good, but it's not fair for me to impose my, my issues, my criticism on the people that I love. Uh, I want to I do it right and not vomit it on them to where they're carrying that burden and where it's eating them away, right? And so this acidic criticism corrupts. It corrupts those people that we're near and dear to. It corrupts us first and eventually ends up corrupting them as well. So why acidic criticism? Well, I had to think back to you know, junior high school. I think it was sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade, we got to do um, science, chemistry, to where they started to pull out the chemicals. And I remember as a boy, I remember when they started to say, we're going to work with acid. Now, acid's very dangerous, you know, and like boys are like, yes, I get to burn stuff, right? Right, I get to see stuff dissolve and, and all this stuff. But I had never had never experienced acid personally before that, right? I had never used it for anything. Um, you know, I, you know, later in life I learned how to make like toilet bowl bombs and stuff like that with uh, two liters and the works bottle cleaner because it had and foil. Remember those? Remember those? Yeah. <laughs> Side note, I did one of those in the backyard and like two day, two days later exploded. My neighbor was out there. Oh, I got in trouble. <laughs> big trouble for that one. But side note, I didn't tell that the first service. You guys are lucky. So, um, but I never got to play with like acid in that regard because it's dangerous, right? Don't, the best thing that I had to, to being close to acid was Mr. Wizard. You guys remember Mr. Wizard a Nickelodeon? You guys remember this? I have a graphic right there. Mr. Wizard's World. Do you guys remember watching that? I watched that all the time. Love that show. For you younger kids that don't know who Mr. Wizard is, it's like Mythbusters right? But, um, or some of the science guys you see on YouTube, it's equivalent to that. And uh, I love this show. I love Mr. Wizard because he played with all kinds of gases and acids and all these fun little things. But sixth grade, here we are, we get to play with acid, right? But it was kind of boring because all we got to do is drop different pieces of metal in there, little things of plant life and see how the acid dissolved them. But it did bring a, a point out that acid destroyed anything it touched. It did. It destroyed anything it touched. Anything that you dropped in there, it would eat it away. Now, it may not eat all the way through it, but it did. It continued to work its way through it. And then it made me think about my boys. It made me think about our lives, how we let this criticism build up in us. And I'm like, where does this start? Where does this criticism begin? Because I look at my boys, and they're, they're the happiest kids on earth. I mean, the only time they're fighting is when they're not winning at Fortnite or somebody's stealing their guns on Fortnite. You stole my guns. How dare you do that? And I'm like, why are you guys fighting over a stupid game? I mean, uh, but those are the times that they're, they're angry at each other. But for the most part, they're happy. They're naive. They're just happy-go-lucky, ready to take on the world. It's just a giant bubblegum ball for them to enjoy. And there's just not a lot of hurt. There's not a lot of pain. They get to enjoy life as it is. It's like, it's just like one big bag of sugar, right? They get to be this little enjoyment. And we were all there at one point as kids. We were there at one point where nothing seemed to bother us. It's, life was just good. There was no hurt, no pain, no sorrow, no things that could well up inside of us. 
And so as I began to think about this acid and about how, where, does this, where does this begin in our lives, I came to this point, it says acidic critical words begin to eat holes in the souls of those around us. We let this build up as we get older and as we experience these things. Acidic critical minds, our minds, as we let these things um, begin to take root in our minds, they etch deep scars in our families and our marriages and in our friendships. These acidic critical hearts, our hearts, that we allow this to get to a point, destroy the love and trust that we all long for. See, it's kind of like this clip I'm going to show you. What happens is we're, we're, we're born like just full of sweetness and goodness, right? God just, we, I know my, my little Hudson, he's three, and he just, before uh, church started, he's just running up to me, Daddy, and just giving me a big hug. And it's like you can't help but love it because he just loves you unconditionally with abandon. He just, just does it. And everybody, everybody sees him just like, oh, that's sweet. We were all there at one point. We were all there at one point, but something happens. And this experiment that we're going to watch, I think this gives us a good visual of what happens when acid is poured onto the sugar in our life. Let's watch this. See, it's kind of gross, isn't it? At the same time, it's kind of cool. As a kid, you're like, going, remember snakes? Oh, yeah, that's like a snake. The little firecracker things you lay on the ground, right? So, but I think what, what comes out of our own lives is as we let this criticism, this acidic criticism, as we let it take root in our lives, just like they poured it into that sugar, eventually, in the beginning, it becomes a little brown and slimy, right? And it's not doing a whole lot. But as we continue to pour more in, as we continue to poke it and prod it and stir it in and we let it fester, it becomes black. And eventually it begins to release that smoke and then eventually it begins to grow. And not only does it stay within our hearts and our minds, it begins to come out of our mouths. And we begin to speak this and we begin to proclaim this to the people around us. And it's just vile. It's vile in how we do it. It's vile in how we just let it spew out of our mouths and harm those people that are around us. In Luke uh, chapter 6, 45, uh, verse 45, Jesus gives us just a great example of how this happens. It says, The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. See, just like that experiment all the goodness that God's given us and put inside of us, if we allow the devil room to use that criticism in a negative way, it just bursts itself out of our heart, out of our mouths, into those people we love. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, this is a, you know, the subheading in most Bibles says taming the tongue. And I want to read this because this is just illustrates even more so the power that our words have, but how they begin, remember, in the heart. 
Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. See, it starts in the heart. We let it fester in the heart. We keep adding to it in the heart. We keep stirring it, prodding it. But then eventually it comes out of the mouth. And what James says there, with the same mouth that we give praise to God, we curse our brother. We curse our wife, our kids, our coworkers, our friends, our family. It just comes up from within, this acidic criticism. And I think a lot of times, like I said before, it happens because we can't meet our own expectations, and so we impose them on other people. See, ascetic criticism corrupts. But what should we do? How do we handle this then? How do we rectify this ascetic criticism? There's not a whole lot that can dilute acid. We need a base to, to balance that acid out. But we can use water to dilute it. It doesn't dilute it completely, but if we pour enough water on it, we can dilute it. And that's one thing I love about God's word, because in God's word, we, we do have the answer. We have the answer in how we can handle this ascetic criticism in our lives. And I, and I think as we get ready to launch into a new year, I was just praying and, and believing that this message is something that we need to hear. How can we go into 2019 with a better outlook? How can we go into 2019 speaking words of life rather than speaking words of death? Speaking words of life to the people that we meet each and every day, to our wives, to our kids, to our coworkers. How can we be the example? How can we be the church that speaks those words of life so that people know that there's something different in us? Not that we're happy-go-lucky all the time and that there's no cares in the world. No, 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 no. That sometimes that's just, you know, not wanting to deal with the problem. No, we, we need to deal with the issues. We need to confront those head on. But how can we be authentically just so uh, willing to want to be and help each other and build each other up? How can we do that in 2019? And I think for first and foremost, it really starts with us repenting. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not hard, right? All we have to do is say, God, help us. God, help me. Help me with my heart first and foremost. Help me with all the acid that I've allowed into my life. Help me remove it. Help me get rid of it. God, I repent and I ask for your forgiveness. Repent for the acidic, critical words that we've spoken. Repent for the acidic, critical mind that we've allowed to take root and how we've used it to torment those that are around us and ourselves even. Repent for the acidic, 
critical hearts that we've grown inside of our chests and that are tearing us apart. Repent for those and let God begin his work. And what I love about the visual of acid and water is that God will begin to cleanse us from within. When we repent, he begins to cleanse us. Oh, what John 4, 14 says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When I was um, 18, I went on a missions program called Ace Teams, and it was just around the state of Illinois um, through the church I attended and eventually worked at at Faith. And um, there was a girl, Amy, that I had known from high school, and um, she was a good friend. But we had kind of parted ways in high school, and she had gotten involved in a, a really bad group of kids and just got real heavily into drug use and just a lot of different things. But I remember when I came back from ACE teams um, in the spring, I remember seeing her at church And all I remember seeing is her in the foyer. But when I left, she was about 95 pounds, and she was just real skinny, dark eyes, circles on her eyes. And you could just tell that she was on a quick path to death. But when I came back, something changed. God changed her. She gave her life back to Christ, and there was just almost like Moses coming down from the mountain. There was just the glory of God that surrounded her. And she just shone bright. I remember just crying, going like, man, Amy, it's just amazing to see what God did in your life. See, God cleanses. When we repent, he cleanses. Not only does he cleanse, he renews. He renews us from the inside out. And there's not a thing in this world that can compare to that. When you see that firsthand, when you see that life changed from darkness to light, when you see that happen, there's no doubt that God is real, that God is alive, and that God renews people's hearts and minds and souls. She's now um, with her husband, Mark, and um, she's on Facebook, and she's got her own little ministry, and uh, serving the Lord and, and talking about prophecy and things to come. But it's neat to see how God just turned her world upside down. And all it took was for her to say that she confessed her sins to God, and he did that to her. And it's amazing to see that. So we repent. First, we repent. We ask God for forgiveness. Next, we ask God to cleanse us. And it's going to take time. It doesn't always happen immediately. Sometimes we see that. Sometimes we see people like Amy where it's more immediate. Sometimes it takes a working of that faith out to where we get to see that cleansing take um, root over time, to where that washing just continually washes away that acidic um, destruction that once was there. And it may take some time, but as long as we stay faithful to God and his word and doing his will, I guarantee he's going to see it to end. Matter of fact, we all as Christians who said yes to Jesus, we get to work that out day by day until we meet the Lord and Savior, right? We're not perfect. We won't be perfect on this earth, but we have his grace and his goodness to help us with that. But then the next step is for us to ask. And this is probably one of the harder steps. We need to go to those people that we've hurt, those people that we've vomited out that acidic criticism. We need to go to them and say, God, God has led me here, and I need to ask for your forgiveness. I need to have your forgiveness in this situation because I hurt you. I spoke words of death to you, or I just continually bombarded you with my negativity and my acidic criticism. I need you to forgive me. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's something we do, but we don't get the answer we want because those people, they haven't come to a place where they're ready to forgive. But the step is worth it because I know that in us even asking for it, God does a work in our hearts. He does a work in our minds. And sometimes it's hard for us to even move on if we don't do that because we need to let that go and we need to let God. I love what James 5.16 says. 
It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That water brings healing into our hearts, into our minds, and to those around us. But that's not it, right? That's not it. It's not just repent, cleanse, and ask. No, that, those are steps we need to take. But how do we keep the devil from coming back and saying, but, right? He always likes to say that, right? But what about this? Or maybe we get into constructive criticism, and then it just kind of continues spiraling down, and we just find these other ways to just continually rip on whatever the issue is, right? See, the devil always likes to bring it back around and remind us of our failures or, or maybe the things that we've said or maybe the things that other people aren't living up to our standards. And so it's easy for us to get sidetracked and to go right back down that same old spiral and to continue pouring out that acidic criticism. But how do we beat that? How do we combat that? How do we continually fight the devil on that? And I think it's easy. It's praise. And you're like, oh, you're just a worship guy. That's why it's praise. You're just a music guy, right? No, no, no. No, it's praise. We give God praise. Because when we give God praise, it gets our eyes off ourselves. Most of the time, our criticism, our gossip, anything that comes out of our mouth is because we're looking at ourselves and our situation, and it's not up to our liking. And we want to control that situation. But God's ultimately in control. And so when I give God praise, it puts it in perspective. God, you are in control. God, I'm not the focus. You are the focus. So first we give God the praise. Psalm 150, verses 2. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Because he's worth it. Because of what he did for us. Because of him dying on the cross. He deserves our praise. And then second, we give praise to others. How many of you have struggled giving praise to others? Is it hard sometimes? Sometimes it's hard, right? Sometimes we look at that person and we're like, nah, he doesn't deserve it because he's cocky enough, right? Or she's cocky enough, right? This is going to boost his ego, right? Or you know what? Man, they did a great job and I, I could have done better, Right? It's hard to give praise sometimes. It's hard to give praise to others because we have to put them above us. So one, first to God, second to others. We also know that praise leads to humility. I think I had the verse wrong on, on that. Or, yeah, I think it's James 4.10. But it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will. Will exalt you. When we give praise to God, it humbles us because we recognize the depth of what God has saved us from. And then praise dilutes and removes acidic criticism. Just like that water, it just continually takes it away and washes that away. Psalm 103, 2 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. As we give praise to God, it removes that from our lives. And then praise pleases God and others. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. See, acidic criticism corrupts, but praise is pleasing. It's pleasing to God, first and foremost. It's pleasing to us and to others around us. And it's pleasing, and then it's pleasing to others. So praise is the way that we combat it. First, we repent. We let God do his cleansing, and we ask those people for forgiveness. And then ways that we combat it, the way that we combat that acidic 
criticism in our lives is that we give praise. Praise to God. Praise to um, others. And we get to see God do that work and keep us from going back down that spiral of criticizing and spewing out that just disgusting vial that comes out when our hearts aren't right with God and, and what he's done in our lives. And so this morning, as the band comes out, what I wanted us to do is just take a moment for us just to repent. Maybe, maybe there's just one thing. Lots, a lot of times it's not that we're, we're critical about everything, right? It's usually one or two things. Sometimes it may be a coworker at work. It may be a boss. It may be um, a coach or a teacher. It may be your spouse. Maybe there's something that you and your spouse need to work out. Maybe it is your kid. Maybe there's something there. But I think in all things, when it comes to God, we first need to start at home. We need to start in our own hearts and our own minds and say, God, what's wrong here? If I'm critical, acidic criticism is in my life, God, rid it. Rid my heart and mind of it. Rid those things in my life. And then, God, I want to see you start to cleanse me in my heart, in my mind. Start to cleanse that and help me get your word into my life. Help those things fill me up. And then, Lord, as I go out and ask people for forgiveness, Lord, let me see that come to resolution. Let there be forgiveness. Let there be unity in our hearts. Let there be a common goal in mind that we get to walk with each other hand in hand, side by side, to do what you called us to do. So as we bow our heads this morning, let's just... Um, pray this prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and to learn about you, God, and to be reminded of how to uh, manage our heart and our words. And Lord, I just pray that this morning, if there be anyone in this room, if there be any acidic criticism, God, that has just eaten away at their heart and their mind and their soul. Lord, let this be a moment where they get to turn back to you. Where they get to just lay it at your feet and say, God, I can't. I can't carry this anymore. I don't feel anything inside. I have no empathy or sympathy for anyone. All I feel is darkness and bitterness and loneliness because I've pushed everybody away. My words have torn down the people I love the most. And God, I pray this morning that as they come before you, God, that you begin that cleansing work. Lord, that you begin to restore their heart and their mind and their soul. God, that they begin to experience in this moment, in this instant right here now, God, your goodness and your grace. Lord, as your water begins to spill up their heart and their mind, as that living water begins to take root in their life, God, I just pray that they get to experience a refreshing of your presence and your spirit in their lives. God, I have to be honest. I don't want to live this life without your presence. We're so content in so many things, God, that we just want enough of you. But God, I pray that this morning that there'd be in all of our hearts a renewal as well, that we get to experience more of you that we want to spend more time with you. God, that we devote ourselves to prayer and fasting so that we can see you come to life in our, our world. We live in a dark place where everybody is criticizing everybody and nobody can do the right thing sometimes because they're afraid of what may happen or what people may say to him. But God, help us to stand up for what's right. Help us to speak truth. Help us to speak life. No longer words of death, 
but God, words of life that you've given us, that you are the hope of the world, that you, God, live in our hearts, that you live in our minds. God, that you reign supreme in all that we do. And out of our mouths, God, come praise. Out of our mouths comes life. Out of our mouths come goodness and grace and mercy for what you've done. I can't let the devil win anymore. And God, I pray at the end of 2018, let it just be the beginning of something great. And as a church, as a church family, we get to stand up together and proclaim that God is good and that together we're going forward. And then we're going to lift each other up. We're going to build each other up. And we're going to push on together as a family to see the kingdom of hell defeated. God, and that people who are dying and going to hell, that no matter what they've done, no matter who they are, no matter how they may have hurt us, God, that they do need you. That they do need your salvation. They do need your grace, God. And they are worth it because you said they're worth it. God, you died on a tree to prove that they're worth it. And God, I pray that you help us to see that in our own hearts, in our own minds, that no matter what they've gone through, no matter what they've experienced, no matter what they look like, God, they are worth it to you. Lord, help us to not let the acidic criticism corrupt us, God. But let us give praise that pleases you, God, and praise to others. As you see them doing good works for you and for your kingdom. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, for your love and your goodness. Amen. Let's go and stand up together. Before we sing this song, I just wanted to pray this over us before we leave. Here's my prayer for you today. May the Holy Spirit help you rid the acidic criticism in your life as you pursue repentance, restoration, and praise. And let us give praise to God each and every day to humble ourselves, embrace His goodness, and to build each other up for His glory and name. Remember, make sure you talk about this with your life groups. And if you're not in a life group, you can stop by Connection Central. We'd love to get you plugged into a group. And remember, just like you've been helped to take your next step towards God today, go out and help others do the same. Let's speak words of life to all that we come in contact with. Be a Jesus follower who makes and disciples other Jesus followers.